Hi, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to Faith of the Fathers. So in the last video, which would have been part two of Kaiser to Council, I said that the next video would cover Justin Martyr. I'm sorry, but again, a little bit of a delay or change of plans. I realized Easter's coming up. Right now, it's the Holy Week between Palm Sunday and Easter weekend. And so I figured, let's do something a little bit more directly Easter relevant. Justin Martyr, of course, does talk about the stuff relevant to Easter, but we're going to put him off. There's someone who talks about something a little bit more focused on what we're, as a church, we are focusing on through this week. And this figure is called Melito of Sardis. Now, there's not a whole lot we know about him. Most of his works are actually lost to the ravages of history. And up until the early 1900s, all we had were fragments. And those fragments were not pieces that had been all that's left of a parchment. Rather, it was actually quotations in other works. For example, Eusebius of Caesarea has large paragraphs that he quotes from Melito's works. And uh, Eusebius actually lists Melito among the apologists in the second century, which connects him to Justin Martyr. And so in the next video, we'll talk about the apologists. But uh, Melito also is known for have, having written a treatise or a letter to Emperor Antoninus Pius. And you remember who he is in Kaiser to Council. We talked a bit about him. So Eusebius refers to uh, Melito as, quote, the eunuch whose walk and conversation were all together under the influence of the Holy Spirit. That's kind of high praise, isn't it? A special guy, rather worth listening to. And honestly, this, what we're going to talk about is very powerful and beautiful. So, like I said, we only had fragments of his work until uh, about a hundred years ago when there was actually a uh, document that was discovered that contained the Greek text of his sermon called De Pascha, or On the Passover. And so this is a very powerful sermon, and it's the only full text of Melito that we have that's survived history so far. Uh, some of the other things he's known for before we get into this sermon is he's one of the first people or one of the earliest people to start talking about this relationship between the church and Rome or in a really interesting way that there is a way to kind of bring the two together that it's almost like Rome and the church kind of God kind of prepared them in a way that they can work together for uh, God's purposes. And another thing, too, he's one of the first figures, or he's actually the earliest account we have of a church leader providing a list of the Old Testament books, like what should be included in the Christian Old Testament. And he actually does use that language of the Old Covenant. Uh, so this is the earliest example of, that we have of this. And it was probably around the year 176, give or take, in, those, in that range. So getting into his sermon here, De Pascha, very fitting for this period of Holy Week we are in. His sermon is generally an exposition of Exodus 12, talking about the Passover in Exodus, also the final plague, the death of the firstborn in Egypt, and then, of course, Israel exiting Egypt. But his whole purpose is he's pointing out the Christological focus of this Old Testament passage, that ultimately these Old Testament things like the slaughter of the sheep and the blood on the door are really just figures that prefigure Jesus. And he walks through, how does this work? How are they connected? Now, just a note before I read some of these quotes, uh, I'm going to read you some passages from this sermon. But whenever you hear the, the word, word. This is the Greek word logos or logos. Now, this does not refer to like modern evangelicals. When we say word of God, we generally mean Bible. The ancient church, not so much, partially because there was no Bible that they had. They were still debating what's in the Bible, what's not. So it was actually when they say the word, they're actually talking about reason or logos, the speaking of God and kind of the early Christological discussions on the nature of Christ as being the speaking, the reasoning power of who God is. And then, of course, John 1, the word, the Logos, became flesh. And so this is kind of how it's all fitting into this developing theology. So getting into his sermon, 
To start off, he points to this mystery of Passover. He says, the mystery of the Passover is new and old. It is old according to the law, but new according to the word. By being figure, it is involved in time. By being grace, it is eternal. As the slaughter of the sheep, it is corruptible. As the life of the Lord, it is incorruptible. Because of the burial in the ground, it is mortal. But because of the resurrection from the dead, it is immortal. Like I said, this whole sermon revolves around Christ and how he is the culmination or the reality behind the shadow of the Old Testament and these figures. And this is largely against, we're going to talk when we get into Irenaeus, we'll talk about Marcion and his agenda. So in many ways, Melito is probably focusing on kind of redeeming the Old Testament, showing how it is Christian scripture. This is not meant for the Jews, it, as he would say it probably, that it's actually for the church, that it, the Old Testament talks about Jesus. And so we see figures in the Old Testament, their shadows, but then the reality that casts the shadow we see in the New Testament in Jesus. He goes on to say in his sermon, he actually has this fun, interesting thing where he addresses the angel of death that went through and slaughtered the Egyptian firstborn as if he's talking to the angel. And he says, it is clear that you were deterred because you saw the mystery of the Lord coming to pass in the sheep. The life of the Lord in the sacrifice of the sheep, the prefiguration of the Lord in the death of the sheep. That is why you did not strike Israel, depriving only Egypt of children. And so it's that, why did the angel redeem Israel or not touch Israel, but was horrible to Egypt? Why was that? Well, because the angel saw Jesus among Israel. And so the angel didn't strike Israel. And so this is, again, building on that typology. The angel spared Israel because the lamb, the blood of the lamb, prefigures the blood of Christ. And then it's through a discussion on, it, like he continues on and moves into a discussion on sin's tyrannical hold on us. That we are slaves of sin. And so at this point in the church, we don't really have a discussion on sin as necessarily guilt. That's not necessarily a central feature in how the church talks about sin as like personal guilt that's inherited from Adam. That's not something that comes into the church until much later. Uh, at this point in the church, the focus tends to be more on a tyrannical overlordship, that we are subservient and slaves of sin, not necessarily guilty, but enslaved and corrupted and uh, like helpless with uh, under the tyranny of sin. And so he says this, that... Um, what had been given by God was closed up into Hades. It was carried away captive under the shadow of death. And to bring this home, he, bring, he now turns to Jesus. He walks through that discussion on sin and comes then over to who, who is Jesus here. He says, this is the one who covered death with shame and made a mourner of the devil, just as Moses did Pharaoh. This is the one who struck lawlessness a blow and made injustice childless as Moses did Pharaoh. It's, it's I love how the early church does this. They personify these things. At He's personifying lawlessness and injustice, that they are almost like actual figures. Well, he kind of even talks about them as if they are demonic powers. Lawlessness and injustice themselves are actual persons that are corrupting and attacking God's people. And so Christ comes in and he defeats them and he makes injustice childless, just like the Egyptians were childless. And he makes lawlessness a more like to mourn and weep. And so then he bring continues on. He is the Passover of our salvation. For he's so Milito is talking about how Christ is then this reality behind the shadow. That what are the shadows of the Old Testament? He, he lists a few examples here. That Christ, not only is he the Passover of our salvation, he is the one who in many folk bore many things. He is the one who was murdered in the person of Abel, bound in the person of Isaac, exiled in the person of Jacob, sold in the person of Joseph, exposed in the person of Moses, sacrificed in the person of the Lamb, persecuted in the person of David, dishonored in the person of the prophets. So it's highlighting where do we see Jesus in the Old Testament? 
We see him all over the place. We see someone being murdered in the Old Testament. We see Jesus there, and it points to the fact that he was unjustly killed. We see someone being exiled. Jesus was exiled. He had to flee down to Egypt, and he was abandoned by his people. He was dishonored, sold like Joseph, and of course, slaughtered like the lamb. And then to bring it home, I'm going to read the last chunk of his sermon. It's just a beautiful way to bring an end to this, uh, for this video here. And I pray that this sermon can bless you in this holy week as we reflect on who Jesus is. And as we do that, I want to leave you with the words of Milito at the end of his sermon. The Lord, when he had put on the human being and suffered for the sake of him who was su who suffered and was bound for the sake of him who was imprisoned and was judged for the sake of the condemned and was bur buried for the sake of the buried, rose from the dead and cried aloud, who will enter into judgment against me? Let him stand up and face me. I have set the condemned free. I have given the dead life. I have raised up the one who was entombed. Who will speak against me? I, he says, the Christ, I have dissolved death. I have triumphed over the enemy and trodden down Hades and bound the strong man and carried off humanity into the height of the heavens. I, he says, the Christ. So come, all families of human beings who are defiled by sins and receive remission of sins. For I am your remission, I the Passover of salvation, I am the lamb sacrificed for your sake, I am your ransom, I am your life, I am your resurrection, I am your light, I am your salvation, I am your king. I lead you toward the heights of heaven, I will show you the eternal father, I will raise you up with my right hand. So this is he who made the heavens and the earth and formed humanity in the beginning, who is announced by the law and the prophets, who is enfleshed in the virgin, who is hanged on the tree, who was buried in the earth, who was raised from the dead and went up into the heights of heaven, who is sitting on the right hand of the father, who has the authority to judge and save all things, through whom the father made the things which exist from the beginning to all the ages. This one is the Alpha and the Omega. This one is the beginning and the end, the beginning which cannot be explained and the end which cannot be grasped. This one is the Christ. This one is the King. This one is Jesus. This one is the leader. This one is the Lord. This one is he who was risen from the dead. This one is he who sits on the right hand of the Father. He bears the Father and is born by the Father. To him be the glory and the power to the ends of the ages. Amen. Amen.